Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm told I speak too low, so I'm going to try and speak up. And um, the voice gets lower. So I'm here to speak to you this evening about that Trojan queen, that Trojan queen being Hecuba, um, the fabled queen of Troy, the Phrygian horsewoman, all the statues of her, the wife of Priam, the mother of 18 children, they say, if you believe all the legends. Some say, um, an interesting fact, that uh, Shakespeare based King Lear, or that Lear is Shakespeare's response to Hecuba. Um, or to put it another way, Lear is the male Hecuba. There are many parallels. Both inhabit a haunted universe. The gods are absent in both. Both had everything, both lose everything. One howls on the heath, one on the shore, their children dead at their feet. Both are pushed beyond the limits of what one might justif justifiably be asked to endure on what Sappho calls this black earth. The Greeks went around calling everyone except themselves barbarians. But H.G.F. Kitto, the famous scholar on all things Greek, says that the Greeks were the original barbarians. And what they did at Troy was something more than war. It was the annihilation of an entire civilization. It was genocide. There's something about Troy in all our imaginations, the image of it as a race and us as the human race. And in a way you could say we all lost Troy, that that Bronze Age pink walled city held something beautiful and mysterious about us that we've forgotten, that we buried something sacred there. If you believe in the spirit, in what Yeats calls beautiful, lofty things, then we are, all of us, all the poorer without Troy. Euripides, that great Greek playwright, wrote a play called Hecuba, circa 500 BC. Now, my Hecuba, the cheek of me, is a response to Euripides across the centuries. And while I love and admire the plays of Euripides, I feel he did an injustice to Hecuba. Um, I always thought Hecuba got an extremely bad press, largely thanks to Euripides. Rightly or wrongly, I never agreed with the verdict on her. So, the Hecuba I wrote is an attempt to re-examine and in part redeem a great and tragic queen. History, as they say, is written by the winners. Sometimes I think myths are too, and the fragile Greek state circa 500 BC needed to get certain myths in stone to bolster their sense of themselves and validate their savage conquests. It was very easy to trash Hecuba. She was dead for 700 years. She was Trojan. She was the enemy, and most of all, she was a woman. No doubt she was as flawed as the rest of us, but to turn a flaw to a monstrosity smacks to me of expedience. So my Hecuba is an attempt to show her in another light how she suffered, what she might have felt, and how she may have reacted. So I'm going to read to you from the first part. Um, I'm the one cheating tonight. Everybody else has their stuff off by heart, but it's one of the joys of being a playwright. You get to read. You don't have to learn it off by heart. So... And um, what you might need to know, just a little background knowledge on this. So Hecuba obviously is the queen of Troy. She's married to Prime, is the king of Troy. And um, the other person in this scene is Agamemnon, and they speak together. Agamemnon is the Mycenaean king. He's head of the Greek army. It wasn't Greece then. Actually, they were just bands of warring punks looking for advantage, is basically what they were coming to Troy. Apparently, they were up, of, up on 40 kings who came to Troy looking for plunder and booty, and one more vicious than the next. So he and Agamemnon, or he and Hecuba will speak. Other names mentioned in this scene, Cassandra, the little prophetess, one of the daughters of King Priam and Queen Hecuba. She foretold it all and nobody would believe her. This is how she was cursed by Apollo. Polyxena, the other daughter of Hecuba. By the time the play is over, Polyxena will have been sacrificed on an altar by the Greeks. So the wind can change or not change or blow or not blow. It's very difficult to know what's meant to be going on with the Greek wind. Um, then Polydorus, the youngest, last living son of Hecuba and Priam. Helen, 
the famous Helen of Troy, the face that launched the thousand ships. Apparently, Helen was the reason the Greeks went to war against the Trojans because Paris had stolen Helen, etc., etc. Some say Helen was never in Troy, that the Greeks made her up, that they was, they, she was the reason they gave for invading Troy. Not much has, has changed, really. There are still reasons being invented to invade other countries, so it seems that centuries change, epochs change, locations change, but human nature does not change very much. The bloodlust in us seems to be as terrifying as ever. I'm your prophet of gloom and doom tonight here. I apologize in advance. Okay, so this is Hecuba and she's in the throne room. Troy has fallen, Hecuba. So I'm in the throne room, surrounded by the limbs, torsos, heads, corpses of my sons, my women trying to dress me. Blood between my toes, my son's blood, six of them, seven of them, eight. I've lost count. Not that you can count anyway, they're not complete. More an assortment of legs, arms, chest, some with the armour still on, some stripped, hands in a pile, whose hands are they? Ears missing, eyes hanging out of sockets. And then Andromache comes in screaming, holding this bloody bundle, my grandson, intact except for his head, smashed off a wall like an eggshell. They're through the south gate, she says. They've breached the citadel. They're here. I say, put them with the rest. Put them beside Hector, his father's mangled body. She won't stop screaming. Shut up, I say. You'll draw them on us. I tell the women to cover her mouth. We have no soldiers to protect us, all dead or still fighting, trying to save their own women, children. And I don't know where Priam is. He went out a while ago. When was it? Last night? Yesterday. My women are putting perfume on me. Perfume. I swat them away. The smell of blood, wading in it, the tang of rotting bodies everywhere, bodies that came out of this body and I want to vomit, but there's nothing in my stomach. They've cut off our food supplies. And Cassandra standing at the throne, that smirk on her face, I told you so. Did I not tell you so? And I could kill her right now. And Polixena looking at me, petulant, willing me to turn it all around, make it all right, make sense of it. And I'm glad at least my little Polydorus is safe. We've sent him to Thrace away from all of this. And then a soldier comes reeling in the door, Priam's head in his hands, my husband's head. They've beheaded him in the great sky god's temple. I say, where's the rest of him? What good is a head? We can't bury his head without the rest of him. And the soldier says, I don't know, they've burnt the temple. Burned the temple. The whole city's in flames, he says, and he puts Priam's head into my hands. I sit on the throne, holding it like a baby. His tongue's hanging out. His eyes are terrifying. A ferocious death. I try to close his eyes. They're caked with blood, crust, dust. I can't close them. And the soldier's weeping on his knees, holding my ankles. All the men castrated, he says, not enough to kill them. Must desecrate them too. And I say, the women. What about the women? The children. The women too. They're killing the women, he says. All the old ones, the ugly ones, the ones past past childbearing, past work, and the children, I say. Priam's head is oozing onto my dress. The children, he says, all the boys and all girls under 10. Why, I say, though I know it's a stupid question. Not enough room in the ships, he says. They're rounding them up, have them in the cattle pens, and I think this is not war. In war, there are rules, laws, codes. This is genocide. They're wiping us out. And then there's shouting, clashing of swords, more screams, and Agamemnon is in the throne room. This is Agamemnon. Fabled queen, I say. She hears the mockery in my voice, though it's not complete mockery. I've been wanting to get a good look at her for a while. And there she is, perched on her husband's throne, holding what? His head? The blood flowing down her arms, and what arms they are, long and powerful. What's that, I say? She doesn't answer, just looks at me as if I'm a goat herd. The snout cocked, the straight back. 3,000 years of breeding in that pose. This is Hecube again. They told me many things about him, this terror of the Aegean, this monster from Mycenae, but they forgot to tell me about the eyes, sapphires, transcendental eyes fringed by lashes any girl would kill for. I pretend I don't know who he is. And you are, I say. You know damn well who I am. He laughs, and you may stand, Agamemnon. And she says she'll stand when she feels like it. So I lift her off the throne. Now that wasn't too difficult, was it, I say? I can't resist twirling her, though I know I should show more respect. Used, but good, still good. 
I was expecting an old hag with her belly hanging down to her knees, but she's all right, there's bedding in her yet. Hecuba, God bless you, he says, as he twirls me, God bless you, but war is hard on the women. He smiles at Cassandra, Cassandra smiles back the little trollop. So you're the man, slit his daughter's throat to change the wind, I say, Agamemnon. And the wind changed, I tell her, the wind changed. Hecuba, and I wonder what sort of wife he must have, this barbarian who calls himself king, Agamemnon. And she's looking me up and down. She has an eye on her. Eighteen children, I'm told. I wonder if they're all priams. I wouldn't mind making a son with her. Only way to start a woman like that out is in bed, take the haughty sheen off her. The arrogance, even while she's skidding in blood, stepping over corpses, the lip curling. This is my husband he he husband's head, she says, brandishing it at me. He didn't even have the decency to give me back his body, Hecuba. These are the remains of my sons, I say, pointing to the dung heap of limbs, heads, hearts, necks, necks I loved and kissed. I have to bury them, I say. Agamemnon says, my men will take care of it. I see the corpse of an infant. Who's that, I say? Hecuba, Scamandrius, Hector's babe. Agamemnon, I thought his name was Astyanax. Hecuba, no, Scamandrius, why do you want to know? Agamemnon, I wonder then, did Hector have two sons? These Trojans, so sly, can't have any of them alive. Where's the boy, I say? What boy, she says. You know what boy, I say. Polydorus, your boy, your last born. Hecuba, I don't know. Agamemnon, you know. Hecuba, he's nine, he's a child. Agamemnon, children grow up fast. Last thing I want is to Trojan sails on the wide Aegean, your boy at the helm. Hecuba, he's no threat to you. Where is he, he says, can see the anger rising in him. A man of sudden rages, can't be thwarted. I must be careful. Prime sent him away for safekeeping six months ago, I say. I don't know where. A stab goes through me. Polydorus, they're going to take you too. Agamemnon, you know well where he is, and the longer this business goes on, the worse it'll be for you. And she starts crying. Please, she whispers, please, the face crumpling. I've seen that look before on my wife's face when they made me drag Iphigenia from her arms. But I can't let the boy live. This is war. These things have to be done. Don't you have children, she says. I have lots of children. The daughters are stunners, can see the mother in them, what she must have been in her prime. Not that I mind the old hens have a weakness for them all said. I'm bored to the nostrils with girls. These long years, they know nothing, understand nothing. But the look in this one's eye, when you're on top of her, I give plenty to see that look, hostile, weighted, challenging, then transported once I get to the animal in her. The young ones won't reveal that. Think it's all flowers and moonlight and concealing. Think they have all of time to declare themselves but this one in starlight might take a while to get her down and will him but by god when you did heck you my husband's body where is it agamemnon i tell her there's no time she has to get on the ships but she's not listening she's losing it we're evacuating troy burning it to the ground this city of liars and rapists she's listening now turns on me blood rising hands shaking with rage goes into a real spittle on her lips as she gives vent you came as guests she hisses hecuba you came as guests rolling in here stinking of goat shit and mackerel and you came with malice in your hearts you saw our beautiful city our valleys our fields green and giving you had never seen such abundance you wanted it you must have it you came to plunder and destroy. Agamemnon and she rattles on about their paved streets, their temples, their marble libraries, their holy Joe priests, their palaces of turquoise and pink gold. I say, where's Helen? We can't find her. Heck, Helen, Helen, Helen was never here and well you know it. Agamemnon, you have to admire her, the brazen stance. I say, you stand here, everything lost and still you lie. Who is this Helen, she says, and if she could get her hands on her, she'd tear her asunder. To enter a man's house, I say, to bed his wife, to kidnap her, to kill her, to do away with the evidence. We want Helen back. We have our dead to bury too. Hecuba, Helen does not exist. You made her up. You needed a reason to take it all. There is no Helen. There never was a Helen. Yeah, 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 he says. That's your version. Cassandra snorts, plays with her bangles, stares at him. We need a treaty, I say. 
I must calm down, save what I can. We need to hammer out a treaty, Agamemnon. Now you want a treaty. The little prophetess is wearing the bracelet I sent her. Young, far too young. The other girl glares, though I know she's no innocent. Gave many happy hours with a bold Achilles. Way past time for treaties, my good lady. I tell the soldiers to round them up, get them on the ships. I'm going nowhere, she says, till I've buried these. She waves her hands helplessly. The place is an abattoir. Thank you very much.